Welcome back, Dr. Julia Shaw. Uh, third time. I've third got, time. I've got your present. Hold on. I've, oh. got, I've kept it in the fridge, though, because it's oh. the third time, and it's a hat trick. Ah. Champagne. Ooh. Has to be bubbles. Exciting. Has Thank to, you. Yeah. Are we going to get drunk? Is that what's happening? <laughs> yeah. I was going to get you a football, but then I thought, what would you do with a football? Because <laughs> girls don't. Oh. Oh, sorry. That's on my uh, What's thing. What's happening? Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so what do you mean? No, girls play football. I'm saying, uh, what would you do with a ball? Would you want a ball? Would you go? Uh, I do have a garden. Would you go for a kickabout in the garden I mean, if I, I bought it to you? You know what? Um, this weekend, I learned that I. So I'm from North America, as you might have guessed. Yeah. Um, and I, we don't have netball. That's just not a thing. We no. don't divide girls and boys into the kind of hoops they throw balls into because it's a weird thing to do. Uh, and uh, it turns out I'm really good at netball. Are you? Yeah. What position? I had did no you play? idea. I, we didn't play in, like we didn't play teams, but I'm really good at throwing the ball into the hoop in netball. Ah, okay. I, turn, I don't need a backboard. Did you play basketball? I did as a kid, but just with friends. Never, yeah. never really. But I was much better than the other people I was hanging out with, which I Were didn't you? expect. <laughs> okay. Who knew? Athletic. Well, maybe I'll buy you a ball next time then. You're bound to come back on again. <laughs> so the last first time you came on, you were talking about the memory. You're an expert on the memory. Any more? The memory. The memory. Any more news on the memory? Anything we need to know? Any, any more learnings on that? Uh, it still sucks. Uh, still unreliable. <laughs> um, still be careful. Uh, the, the one thing that we then talked about the second time, which is the, the update that keeps con- sort of continuing, uh, is I, I launched a startup which helps people record their memories of important yeah. emotional events. And I use AI to help people remember yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's the um, uh, talk spot or spot? What do spot. You mean? spot. Yeah. Yeah. And the website is talktospot.com. Talk right? to spot. Okay, yeah. quickly explain that. That's on the second podcast. And how's that going? It is. Uh, it's going incredibly well. Uh, we now have companies that we're working with. Um, talk to spot is a, uh, so we help people report and record workplace harassment and discrimination. Hmm. Uh, any kind. So it's not just about sexual harassment. It's so uh, men if you will, can yep. use it too. Uh, obviously, but it can also be sexually harassed, but it's it's not a thing for women, is I guess what's important for me to get across. It's for any kind of harassment and discrimination. And it walks you through a chat interview, um, which is completely anonymous and conducted by an artificial intelligence. Mm. And it's effectively the perfect memory interview to help sort of offer a pragmatic solution to turn your memory into evidence. And then you can anonymously submit it to your employer. Yeah, because as you always point out, the memory... It's not very reliable, is it? I always quote you, and people don't believe me when I say when I say look, the memory doesn't work that well. They're like, "No, my memory's brilliant." Everybody <laughs> thinks their memory's amazing, but yeah, yeah. Well, you, although when you talk to aging adults, uh, there a lot of people fear that their memories are getting worse, and there it's also sort of like, "No, maybe you're just getting less confident and appropriately confident in your memory," because I think younger people are overconfident quite often. Right, it must deteriorate though, does it? Like everything. Certain kinds of memory do. Um, so effectively you become a bit less flexible, uh, your brain becomes a bit less flexible as you age, but, um, there's ways around that and effectively it's just changing how you learn a bit. Is there anything you can do to improve your memory as you go, uh, as you age? One of the big things is to try and keep it flexible, try to keep learning. So trying to keep doing new things is right. one thing. Um, because what you want is your brain to be flexible enough to overcome the, I mean, you, effectively from the age of 25, your brain starts to die. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so what you're relying on mm. is that you're not going to get more neurons, probably, although there's been some challenge to that recently. No, no more brain cells. You, but you are going to be able to reconnect the ones that you already have. And so what you want to do is you want to keep trying new things, keep trying to find new ways for those brain cells to connect. Mm. And that can be things like learning languages. That can be trips. That can be just making sure you don't get into a rut. I do. I brush my teeth left-handed because apparently that, Nice. The, yeah. I'm right handed. Apparently you, that helps. But if you it? only do that, that's not enough. So right. effectively that'll work for a bit. And then your brain goes, I know how to do this now. I'm not making new well, that's connections. That's it. I find it, I, I find it just as normal now to brush my teeth left handed as right handed. Exactly. So I've ruined it. You've right, ruined okay. it. You've ruined it. All right. Can you just move your pop shield down just a tiny bit? That's it. So yeah, that's yeah. perfect. All right. You've got your book out, Making Evil, which I've read. Um, it's it's a great book, I've got to say. If if you like thinking a lot, it gets you thinking a hell of a lot, this book. Uh, it did make me feel uncomfortable, though, in various places. That's the and point. Yeah, and also it um, made me realise how hypocritical the human race is and humans are and how we're... Uh, following trends often but we're all what we all class as evil is different all over the world and also we have different as as time moves on what we believe is evil is 
is also is also changing. What made you write the book in the first place? Um, yeah, so so the book is called Making Evil: The Science Behind Humanity's Dark Side, and it comes out on February seventh in the UK. Um, it, what made me write it is that I am a criminal psychologist, so memory is part of what I do. I particularly am interested in memory from a, an evidentiary standpoint. So how do we remember things uh, about sort of crime, for example. So eyewitnesses, how do they remember a crime? How do victims remember a crime? How do perpetrators remember? Uh, and and how it all goes wrong in courts. So that, th that thread is there as well, that sort of criminal psychology. But ultimately, the reason I studied criminal psychology was because I wanted to understand why do people do bad things? Like, why do people hurt each other? Why do people... Um, why do people murder each other? Why do people, or why does one person murder another? Uh, why do people commit terrorism? Why do people commit sexual assault? Why do people, I mean, there's so many different types of bad behavior. Why do people eat meat? I mean, this can go into lots of different directions. Um, and I was the head of the Department of Criminology at South Bank University a couple of years ago. And I created a course for my students called Evil. And that was sort of the, the seed that started to grow into this book because I realized that even if you study criminology at a university, even if you're talking about related topics all the time, you often don't actually get to talk about sort of the core things like what's happening on the news, sort of stuff right now that interests every single person. And so I wanted to give my students a way to do that, to discuss these things and to critically engage with them with science as well. And I couldn't get them to shut up. I mean, I would talk about like, what is evil or who is a terrorist? Could you become a terrorist? Or I would do thought experiments like that. And I divide the room into two and say, you argue for and you argue against randomly. And uh, they would get into heated arguments. Mm. And it was fascinating. I think for them, it was a sort of world changing or certainly thought changing experience where they could see even in my own class, even amongst my peers, we have very different ideas around what these things are and how we should deal with them. So, so I wanted to broaden that experience and give it to a wider audience. And so I taught that two years in a row and then I wrote the book. Why do you think we like evil so much watching it? Watching it. Yeah. So we've become obsessed with narcos or, or whatever it is on TV. We like we like things where there's lots of murder involved, don't we? And something dark and we love it. We love it. I mean, it, also, if you look at bestsellers, I mean, if, like fiction, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, almost all of them have an undercurrent of evil, of manipulation or of crime or of uh, sort of a heist. I mean, there's different different versions of it. Um, I think it's it, when we consume evil through the media, I think there's a safe distance that we have from these things that we find fascinating, where you probably wouldn't or most people probably, I mean, I would, but yeah. most people wouldn't want to sit in a room with a psychopath or with a murderer or with a terrorist. Um, sort of sitting across from an actual human being who's done these things is a scary thing. But through the filter of a movie or a book, you get to engage with the thought processes that that person might have and ask really important questions about yourself and about the other person without having to actually put yourself in danger. Yeah, so but why do we want to live through that? I mean, it's... It's, it's exciting. It, Our uh, brains are primitive and we look think, for do you emotional think stimulation. Do you think we're looking through it because we want to experience it without experiencing it? Yeah, I think that's part of it. And you can't really get into someone else's head in any other way. I mean, you can sort of, especially fiction, can take you into the brain of the person who is the protagonist, right? And so you can go down that road with someone else and really have sort of an em empathetic experience, potentially. Uh, that being said, I think that quite often, we, it's almost like going to the zoo when we watch sort of crime on TV, when we watch true crime in particular, so things that actually happened and we watch them being reenacted. It's like, ooh, look over there. There's this thing I want to look at, but I'm... You know, I can I can engage with it. I can enjoy myself in the process because it's emotional. There's it's interesting potentially, and then I get to walk away and never think about it again. Mm. I don't actually need to be empathetic. I don't actually need to think: Am I capable of these things? Am I potentially able to be in that position that this person's in now? I remember reading American Psycho years ago um, when I was younger and thinking. Should I be reading this? Because it's quite horrific in places. Are you seeing yourself in it, or? Well, no, not really. <laughs> I. I, I and then I started thinking, wow, the author is kind of really laying himself out there by, I can't remember who wrote it now, but whoever wrote it is. Brett Easton Ellis. Who? Brett Easton Ellis. 
Right. So I, I just thought it's interesting because he's now basically saying in his mind he's got some really warped stuff going on. And, you know, uh, you sort of cover it in your book a bit. Are you evil by thinking evil stuff or do you actually have to do the stuff? Mm. So is the author actually evil for being able to think up the revolting things that he thought up in American Psycho or is he only evil if he does them? I mean, I, I don't think, so we've used the word evil a couple of times now, but I don't actually believe in the core concept of evil. So I don't think evil exists uh, as an object or as a person. Um, I, I think that we overuse the term. We use it to mysticize and sort of shroud and veil sort of uh, individuals who we don't understand and we don't want to understand. And it's usually sort of the end of a conversation, right? So you'll, you'll be talking about someone or something and then maybe someone will say, well, that person is obviously evil. And what that person's trying to do is to stop the conversation and say, well, obviously we all agree. You know, we've, here is my final you know, statement and we should move on now. And really that should be the beginning of the conversation, right? We should start engaging with that word at that point and say, well, what do you mean by that? Mm. And how do we understand it? Rather than sort of villainizing and monsterizing this individual. Um, is someone evil for thinking evil? Uh, I think it's really important for us to think through uh, thought experiments. So could I do this? I think that fiction, again, is a great mechanism through which we can do that. We can think through horrible acts because, and this is what I write about in the book as well, uh, just like murder fantasies are adaptive. So a lot of us at some point in our lives are going to fantasize about killing somebody. <laughs> and uh, you laugh. And in the book, I actually no, I approach it more I, lighthearted I, as well. I told you, I found it uncomfortable because I believe <laughs> I'm saint-like, like everyone does. I think I'm a really good person. Right? So who do you want to kill? And then you suddenly read <laughs> stuff where, you, where you're putting a mirror up to me a bit. And I've wanted to kill people in the past. I've Ooh. been so angry. And I'm like, ah. And, and then I realized, well, that is just the, you know, I'm thinking through the act. I'm not, I'm not actually doing it. Actually, I was going to say Elon Musk wants to do that um, brain lace stuff, doesn't he? Where we're all online because we've got a lace in our brains, mm. which, which we can put our thoughts straight online. When people start being able to see each other's thoughts, I think we're going to, I mean, this whole concept of evil is going to change completely because the stuff we think about probably is X-rated a lot of the time, I imagine. And, oh, yeah. And, and we're all virtue signaling our asses off out here, going, oh, I would never do anything. I'm such a lovely person. And mm. then with the thought process, you can actually see into people's heads. Mm, I'm not so not so, so sure we're all so saintly. So, yeah, so, so the idea of killing someone, we all go through, <laughs> do we? Not well, not all of us, but... Many of us. Uh, so according to research on this, most of us have fantasized about killing people. But it's and it's things like, you know, fantasizing about throwing your boss out the window. You know, you've had a bad, <laughs> bad day at work and you're like, oh, just, you know, a little little kick or 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 maybe. And I know this, this all sounds a lot worse, but I mean, the amount of times that I have fantasized about, let's just say silencing a baby on a plane. Because oh, it's really? going off and wailing. Oh, that doesn't and bother like, me. And just like, oh my God, just shut up. Uh, I mean, th those are small thoughts that we have. <laughs> uh, and they manifest in different ways. Uh, and popular targets are our bosses, our, our loved ones. Uh, road rage. Road rage. Oh, oh it must be road one. rage, yeah. 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 Um, and and uh, step parents is a big one. Really? Kind of like in, in like Cinderella, like wanting to kill your evil, gran your, your evil step parent. Yeah. Um, but we don't go through with it, most of us, luckily. Mm. And the question is, why do we have them in the first place? And some evolutionary psychologists argue that they're adaptive because effectively what you're doing is you're thinking through the situation and what the outcomes would or could be. And luckily, most of us, if we have that capacity to sort of think things through and plan, we decide, oh my God, those outcomes are terrible and I definitely don't want to do this. And then we don't engage in that behavior. So it's, it's, it's sort of like a trial run in our brains, which is one of those beautiful capacities that we as human beings have that probably a lot of species don't have in that way that we can really think through complex situations. Mm. And that's interesting because in America where they have firearms lots of guns mm. they can actually take it one step further a lot easier and as as you point out the study in your book the um guns actually it's not people who kill people it's guns which kill people because you actually have the thought process if you haven't got a gun there's nothing you can do about it if you've got a gun you can go and do it can't you and it's Especially when we're talking about killing lots of people. So unfortunately, things like school shootings. Um, I mean, it's, it's much harder to stab a lot of people quickly um, without getting stopped by somebody or, or someone fighting back and, and somehow 
being unable to do it than it is to shoot a lot of people. Um, I think, yeah, it's the, the, the problem with these kinds of issues is that we, we need barriers between our thoughts and our behaviors. And effectively, the, the fact that we have to sort of think things through, or ideally can, and we can't just sort of, in a moment of weakness, pick up a gun and start shooting because we're angry right now, but in a minute we might not be and we might have made a completely different decision. That matters. And so those buffers, and including sort of the kinds of weapons we have available, are really important to help us make better decisions. So mm. um, we, we, have, we all have the propensity for doing awful, awful, awful things. And I think we need to assume that we do because if we don't, we're totally underprepared if we find ourselves angry or in, in situations yeah as i say like in your that. in your book you go through a lot of stuff that we have to um uh i don't know everything from um sex capitalism animal cruelty murder rape it's all in there it's and all in there yeah it is and it's it the way you do it's fantastic though because at no at no point you're pointing fingers you're just examining the science around it it's a really good book for for thinking as i say um when you talk about those school shooters they all tend to be uh male Mm-hmm. White, mm-hmm. Um, lonely. Mm. Is this? Is this? Uh, these people have they? Tur- are they? I mean, you don't want to use the word really evil, but let's use it just for the sake of this interview. But the, have, have they become evil because of this? Because of the rest of the population? What What happens to these people? To what happens? It's tough to say. I mean, it's uh, unfortunately last year was a really bad year especially in the united states for school shootings in terms of the just there's been so many more than we've had in the past so there seems to be an increase in the number even as i was writing the book this number was increasing and so i write in the book that it's still despite that a really rare event compared to most other kinds of crime so the amount of school shooters there is obviously always going to be too much it's always an atrocity but it's nowhere near as many as people who commit other kinds of violence. And so it's harder to study. And it's harder to find commonalities between these people because there just aren't as many of them. Um, so it's, it's difficult to know. But one thing that we do know is that loneliness does play into it. Um, but we also need to be careful not to overstate mental health issues. So I think that it's easy to stigmatize people who are mentally ill. And I talk about sort of creepiness and our intuitive associate assumptions about people who look or act differently than we are and how we need to be careful not to interpret, mm. you know, fear effectively into a situation where someone's just different. Um, and I think that the press has done a good job or if you will, a bad job, uh, linking mental illness with things and even things like depression with school shooting. And so now there might be this extra stigma added to people who have depression or, or have other mental health concerns that are related to that um, simply because people keep hearing this link and they're like, oh, you know, if you're a, a teen who's depressed, are you going to become a school shooter? And obviously mm-hmm. that's an absurd assumption to make and really harmful potentially to people who who have mental health issues. So we need to be careful not to link things too heavily, um, but we also need to remember to see the humanity, and, and these are often kids. Like, mm. it, I think you're right that society does glamorize also and give notoriety, especially in the US, to serial killers and to, to mass shooters. And so that might also have sort of a, a push to, to see that as a real option and to see that as maybe a way of becoming a celebrity. Um, all the way through your book, you talk about dehumanizing though. Um, mm-hmm when you're actually doing an act of evil you often have to especially if it's murder you talk about hitler a lot in it as well where you know you you have to dehumanize people and then it becomes easier to then start killing them Mm -hmm. and i suppose that's a process that these school shooters will go through and uh you know people who go involved in the murder at some stage they have to take away the idea that the person they're killing is is equal human to them is that right Often, yeah. I mean, it, certainly dehumanizing makes us capable of great harm. I think it's it's probably the source of most of the things we really label evil. So, so when we move into things like torture, when we move into sadism, when we move into those kinds of, or, or large-scale um, well, murder and, and harm, like, like in genocide, uh, there certainly dehumanization has an, a critical role to play. You just, you can't see the humanity in someone so, if you're so, going to be yeah go on so did hitler call um uh, jews cockroaches is that what he did he, he used did. lots of dehumanizing words right but, right he he 
considered he, he compared them to insects he compared them to animals he compared them to i mean rats i mean there's there's lots of right. com, like very intentional comparisons that he used uh to help us not think or help his population and his supporters not think about individuals as human beings at all right and and never mind the fact that they're framed as a problem so this is the other piece of it is i think that dehumanization is really critical but then there's also the just reframing people not you, you're not thinking about people you're thinking about problems right and so it's sort of the same when uh, individuals kill others for it, it out of ideological reasons so it's a separate but related in that they're no longer seeing people as people. They're seeing them as capitalism. They're seeing them as problems. They're seeing them as something that's threatening their worldview and the way that they think the world Terrorism work. you're talking about. I'm talking about terrorism, yeah. right? Uh, but also just, uh, I mean, and that can come in various forms, of course. It's not yeah, just Yeah, I remember not having an argu <laughs> argument with my mom once saying, um, look, ISIS don't think they're evil. And she was, of course they do. She couldn't work out in her really? mind. I was going, of course they don't. They think they're doing the right thing. That's right. what they're doing. And it's like, they, you know, they think that they've, whether you think they've been brainwashed or whatever, they think they are doing what's right. That's why they can commit such atrocities. Yeah, I think most humans think that they do bad things for the right reasons most of the time. Right. Uh, occasionally you do things out of sadistic reasons, so you just want to see someone suffer. Um, we have that on a smaller scale, uh, on a personal basis, when we have schadenfreude, when you sort of see yeah. someone at work or who yeah. you really don't like, <laughs> and you see them fail. fail like, oh. yeah. um, so that's a really, really small version of it. But it's the same sort of foundation, that occasionally we do do things intentionally just because we want to harm someone. But... Even there, it's much easier to do if we dehumanize someone or if we don't, if we see them as a problem rather than a person. So whilst we're on Hitler, the I like all the experiments um, that you come up with, the concepts that have been, you know, historically everyone's heard of them, but they're kind of cool. Uh, we Not could all go of through them, them as well. some of them, some of the experiments. Some of the experiments. Oh no, some of the yeah, the things like would you kill baby oh, Hitler? Yeah, yeah. That and the, and then the trolleyology. Mm -hmm. I quite like those as well. Could you can you talk us through a few of those? The the, the theory is. If you had a chance, would you kill baby Hitler? Is that that's yeah, kind that's of a thought experiment. Yeah, right. I and and I guess it's a it's a question that if you don't take it too literally and you don't sort of go, well, you know, but how? You know, there's there's lots of assumptions. It, it really exposes people's assumptions around um, what they think happens when a baby is born and whether babies can be born evil or not. So I mean, there's I think if people who say yes, I would definitely go back in time and kill baby Hitler. Um, often what they mean is that there is this guarantee that baby Hitler would have become adult Hitler. So it's sort of pre-programmed yeah. in the brain. And if they say no, then they might say, it might be thinking, well, A, either... Oops. Sorry, there's somebody at the door. <laughs> oh. um, Mark's uh, going to go it, and answer. It, I mean, uh, like... For myself, I, I waver a bit, but I mostly say, no, I wouldn't kill baby Hitler because I generally don't think killing babies is a good thing to do. I think that's, that's a bad thing to do. And and we don't know. And, and because the, the situation and the political climate at the time was such that, I mean, there could have been another person who would have played a similar role um, who would have come out of that environment. So I think whether we actually needed Hitler the man or just the concepts that he was growing up in and uh, some sort of figurehead who could have been somebody else. Uh, that's the question. Yeah. So I, I would, yeah. Nature I would, or nurture? I, I would do, well, I want to talk to you about free will, but we'll do that in a minute. But I, I would have definitely not kill baby Hitler. You wouldn't I, kill No, because I agree with you. I wouldn't want to go and baby. kill a baby. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I can't see it. Can you go through it? But do the trolleyology. Do a few of those because they're interesting. Yeah. I mean, the trolleyology actually fits in well with the, the Hitler question partly because um now with the if you don't believe in ba killing babies would you not kill baby hitler because you don't like the fact that you would have to kill a baby or well, because you don't think the baby would grow into necessarily grow into the man he became both yeah i both. think a lot, yeah okay. i think there's a lot of factors involved in what made hitler into hitler okay you because you could argue i mean look, i don't know enough about it but you could argue you could kill baby nietzsche and then that would probably help the process as well, you know. <laughs> so, or kill Nietzsche's sister, yeah, who, or the who, or the scientists who started. Well, the problematic scientists who started talking about eugenics. So. Yeah, um, exactly. So you could. You, there's a there's a potential a whole lot of people you could kill to stop it happening. It was yeah. kind of the. How far the, back do you go as well, right? Yeah, is that what? <laughs> Hitler's mom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the the 
the perfect storm's the, the wrong expression to use, but the imperfect storm or whatever, mm. which created that monster, which happened, I think. So. Right, right. Oh, the so. use of the word monster, maybe. Just for people. Because he's still a human being. I feel like we need to be careful also not to excuse him and sort of cre- uh, cast yeah. him as this okay. mytho- mythological creature. Yes. Um, I think it, we, there's always a potential for another Hitler kind of person to emerge. That's um, a really good point, yeah. So. Yeah, so we're, I'm making it a problem by doing that, aren't I? I think so, yeah. yeah. No, I, you're right. I think then we, we, we assume that, you know, that can't happen again or there was this one-off sort of non-human entity that happened. Yeah, we keep doing that with everything, don't we? So especially any sort of terrorism atrocities. Mm. We, th- we think they're one-off, they keep, or school shootings, they just keep happening and happening and happening. And, and that you're right, they mo- write them off as evil monster children and they're just not, are they? They're just not, exactly. They're humans. They're who humans, have, yeah. If something's happened to them. Um, okay, so tell us a trolleyology one then. Trolleyology. Trolleyology has to do with thought experiments around ethical dilemmas. So there's a whole field of study that looks at how people make ethical decisions and what influences this. Now, the reason I asked you whether you wouldn't kill baby Hitler because you don't like killing babies or you don't like the thought of killing babies. Yeah. I presume you haven't killed any, so you don't know no. if you'd like it or not. Um, that's sort of a bit of sadistic <laughs> <laughs> imagery there. Uh, but let's, let's assume that... Um, you're taking that perspective. Now, with trolleyology, when you ask people, for example, if there is a, an out-of-control train coming mm-hmm. down a track and you have the potential and, it, and it's, hit, it's heading for five people who are tied to the track and can't get out of the way in time. And on a diversion path, there is one person tied to the train. Now, would you let the trolley just go straight? Or if you had the chance to pull a lever... Would you pull a lever that would divert the train and kill the one person to save the five? See, I know the answers to all these. I've thought them through after reading your book. I, do you want to know my Go for it, go for it, go for it. I wouldn't pull the lever. You wouldn't because... No, no, because that's me murdering one person. (gasps) Whereas if I let it hit and murder five people, I haven't murdered anyone. Oh. Now, the other one is I'm driving the train, isn't it? It turns into driving the train. Yeah. Now, if I'm driving the train, I'd go for five people rather than one. Oh, sorry, one, one person. person. <laughs> God. One you person. You really want to kill this One five. person rather than five people, yeah. definitely. And then if it was my relative who was the one person, I'd... Who's side of the track? I'd still go for the five people. You'd still go for the... What if the I'd five say, people are all your family members... And the one person isn't. I mean, usually it's the other way around, but sure, let's go yeah. with that. Well, then I'd go for the, I'd go for the one person. I'd, I'd always save my family first. And, right. and I did this with my children the other day. And they're like, what if there was 100,000 people or your daughter? I'd go, I'd go for the 100,000 people. Because <laughs> obviously you're always going to want to save your family. Not obviously, but, I, you know, I, I am saintly, but I'm not that saintly. Would, <laughs> would you go with the same way or not? Would you, would you always save the masses? I, uh, I think what uh, the interesting things that emerge are that, yeah, I mean, you don't need to change very much. You even just need to change that, you know, the five people that, you know, as you said, sort of 100,000 people uh, and you just know one person. You even just know them like you're, they're your friend. Yeah. You might still go for the, uh, the option to, to, to kill the 100,000 <laughs> and save the one, uh, which is really quite problematic if we look at it structurally. Um, but it's. It, it shows that there's a sort of inherent selfishness in ethical decision making, I think. And it's, we're often acting actually because of how things would make us feel. And we think that, so if it's all strangers, yeah. if it's sort of this idea that, um, you know, the five versus one and I don't know anybody, most people in experiments, uh, both in virtual reality, so where they're actually feel, pulling a virtual lever, or in thought experiments like we just sort of talked about, where you just. Ex- describing the situation most people say they would kill the the one to save the five so yeah. most people say yes yeah. i would pull the lever really yeah well then you're a murderer well well i mean you could argue you're a murderer i mean you're not, not really you're not touching it if you just go well it's nothing to do but with that's me. the consequences to you again <laughs> so that's that's you thinking about the con- so why why does it matter if you're a murderer because you might go to prison no just because you're like i actually i actually save those five people but I killed one person when it's it's not in your control just but, just let but it is and being a bystander uh, and letting people die is also you could argue mm. it's not murder quite in the same way but it's certainly there's this great like, thought experiment that someone did I heard once where you if you're walking past and there's a some man standing with a foot on a child's head in a puddle or something you go and help him and you try to get you know you go and get your shoes dirty you do anything to try and get the kid I think it, or the kid was drowning in a puddle you had to go in you you 
you had to you, you get your shoes ruined and everything else but you'd get the kid out of the puddle and you doesn't matter what you would do but you'd do it yet when you're watching tv advert and it says send ten dollars it was an american thing to save a load of children in africa or somewhere mm. you go I'm not interested and mm. carry on it's like hold on why and that's again it's how it makes you feel mm. you're so distant from the from the advert and the African children, whereas that one right in front of you means so much because it's right there in front of you. It's right there, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly the perspective matters, proximity matters, uh, how personal it is matters, who's involved matters, and this idea that, so again, in, in experiments, people say sort of, obviously the greatest good for the greatest number. Mm. That's my ethics. And they sort of take this high horse and say, you know, that's, that's just who I am. And then you say it's your daughter and they go, well, obviously I wouldn't kill my own daughter yeah. no matter what. And so again, it's, 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 it's a selfish morality that we, we might not accept as selfish. Yeah. Uh, but it is. It's about how it makes you feel, well, not they, how it actually affects society potentially. And, and are humans with strange creatures because we're, we're making up all these rules about what's right and what's wrong. Mm. One we're really juggling with at the moment is... Uh, veganism it's a real juggle for us all and and you know it, it seems to be a, a growing movement of people saying animal welfare we don't want to kill and, and eat meat mm -hmm. um and yet it's something we eat to keep us we've always eaten to to for survival i mean i'm not a vegan at all mm. um I, where are we going with veganism? What do we think about that? It, 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 are we? Or, when I interviewed the man years ago, I interviewed the man who made the artificial meat for the burger. He said the reason why he was doing it was because of animal welfare. He said in the future, we're not going to want to kill animals at all for mm. eating. Do you think we're going that direction? I think it's complicated. I think the... I think if we ask ourselves... So, so this is the personal example again. So yeah. let's say there's a cow or let's go cuter. There's, there's a piglet outside your door yeah. and you're hearing it squeal and someone is killing it. Mm -hmm. Now, you would probably run outside and go, oh my God, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Right? And possibly call it animal welfare. You would, you would think this person is a sadistic monster. You would have all kinds of opinions about yeah. this person who's killing this adorable piglet. Um, now, I think that we're quite hypocritical in how we approach meat and that as soon as it's not on our doorstep... We forget the amount of cruelty that's involved in creating meat and turning animals into meat um, in terms of how they're kept, in terms of how they're killed, in terms of how, you know, the whole process has really, really problematic pieces to it that if you saw them firsthand all the time, you probably wouldn't do it. I mean, most people would even struggle to kill any animal in, in person. Mm. Never mind a cute one or one that's, you know, been kept. Even in the wild, we struggle uh, and sort of think, I wouldn't want to get my hands dirty like that. Now, you said we've always eaten meat. I feel like at least there was a, lo there was a long time in humanity where we at least understood what meat was. Like we could see it. I think there's the problem. And we problem. ate a lot less. I think there's the problem is we don't see the death of the animal and we're not around it. And I think that's where the problem's coming from now. Well, that's one issue. So, but, and, and our consumption of meat is, is way higher than it's ever been, partly because it's easier to create meat uh, and because we've removed this, this hurdle. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's one issue. And then there's, of course, the sustainability issue. So the morality, I think a lot of people would say, you know, probably I don't think animal torture is okay. Um, and so there's a, a little bit of guilt maybe in eating meat al along with that. But more than that, I think it's just completely unsustainable for our planet to certainly eat meat in the way that we do now. I think you'll go to artificial meat. I'm sure there'll be artificial meat. I also think that there's just going to be a down regulation of how much people eat. What happens um, then if we go to artificial meat? Is that vegan? I mean, if it's made in a laboratory? I think it depends on your definition of vegan. Right. So, I mean, if you think it's about killing animals, you're not killing an animal, so... Maybe it is. Yeah, vegan. the hypocrisy of me. I'll, I'll eat an animal and then there's a spider in my house and my daughter will go, ah, there's a spider. And I'll go, oh, better take it outside. Don't want to <laughs> flush it down the toilet and kill it. And it's like, hold on a second. I'm just sitting there eating eating meat. Uh, it's, your book has made me realize that. But then I started thinking I've got moths at the moment and they're oh. eating all my clothes. And obviously I want to kill them. I'm yes. sorry, but my evil thoughts, but I want them out of my house because all my holes, jumpers have got holes in them. Is it all right for me to destroy moles what if a vegan gets head lice what happens then are they allowed to kill them or what 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 happens what if you a vegan gets a tapeworm i think you're taking what happens i think it's easy to to uh, make veganism seem ridiculous oh I think, no i'm not at all um, i'm not at all i'm just saying it's it's there's a minefield when you're 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 
you know, I always remember going on holiday to Vietnam and they, there was a, I was in a jungle type area and there was like a noise and I was going, oh God, what is it? And then I went to the guy, is it a tiger or something? I don't know whether tigers are in Vietnam or used to be. But just, <laughs> and he goes, no, no, we've got rid of all the big cats here. It's fine. It's really good now. It's really safe. It's good. Smiling. And I was going, what? Well, you can't do that. Yeah. And then remembering that we got rid of all the wolves and bears from this yeah. country because uh, we don't like them. They Because our... we like to go for walks. Yeah, and they eat all our... <laughs> Undisturbed. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we're so hypocritical. You know, and someone says, let's reintroduce bears. And I'm like, uh, don't think so. <laughs> don't think so. So yeah, we're very hypocritical with it. Or again, it was, an, it was an uncomfortable read with me trying to decide where I morally stand on all these issues. But I do eat meat, so... Yeah, but I think... And, and I mean, with veganism too, it's 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 a... It's about cutting down. It's about thinking about, at the very least, making active decisions. I think a lot of the time when we buy stuff in general, so I mean, I have a whole chapter in there on sort of money and how money changes yeah. our relationship with morality. And I think that just being a conscious consumer is a really important first step. Just, you know, you can make the decision to kill the baby piglet outside your door or have someone else do it, but at least recognize that's what's happening. Mm. Um, and think about it and say, how do I actually feel about this? And have an honest discussion with yourself about what that means rather than just mindlessly, you know, buying fast fashion and meat and things that you know are likely to harm the planet or maybe came from really harmful conditions. Hmm. I wonder what would happen if everyone did start thinking about it. I mean, who's the, who's the, if hopefully everyone will be reading what, evil what or we, making evil. Yeah. And so they will, they will have these discussions with themselves and come up with some better ideas. If we did use, use the word evil, I think the person putting, um, chickens in cages, battery farming and, and the mass farming. I think that is the, the more evil side of it all. The people, but they, that person wouldn't exist if you didn't give them your money. Yeah, I know, but but if they have less stock, you, then the you vote with every dollar you spend. Yeah, but they let less stock. The prices go up. Meat becomes more expensive. We value it more. What happens is they've made meat really cheap. Mm, right. And so you know, I think if if meat was really expensive, if you you know, if every time you bought a chicken it was twenty quid, you'd be going, Christ, we better make the most of this chicken. You know, and it's which right. you and that, that used to be the case. Yeah, it did, as well. Yeah. So right, I mean, it, meat was a sort of like a a bonus thing like a mm. something you would look forward to um and that's just not the case anymore well they said um, uh, my friend um uh, knows a lot of people in kenya his wife's from there he used to go there and they, they he used to say to me i don't know how true this is by the way but he used to say to me do you know how they keep their meat fresh in kenya their goats and stuff and i said no and he goes they keep them alive they kill them and then eat them and then they eat them immediately because they don't have refrigeration where he his his actual um wife's family are from and then when he goes there they give him all the fat because that's the best bit mm. of the of the meat and he's like i don't want to eat this and he's <laughs> but he's like that's what so we they've got a really different relationship with the animal and it's it, it seems to be a we've gone so far away from that which is what yeah. i sort of thought after reading your book well yeah and i mean never mind the environmental consequences the health consequences the sustainability mm. even just the morality is, is problematic but how do we feed with them um, you know the the if, if we all go vegan tomorrow how do we do this what do we have to do chop down masses of rainforest we need more plants no animals it, take up a, way more space is than it is it plants. is it more sustainable way more sustainable okay um you were talking about uh capitalism there the real evil of our our, <laughs> our world should we say um it is it is actually quite it's it's, it's an interesting bit of the book um because you give give a very good examples here making money does seem to be one of the evils doesn't it Making money isn't evil in and of itself or, or isn't problematic in and of itself. I think that what can happen, though, and what we see do, does happen in especially large organizations is that, again, it's really easy to dehumanize people who work in either in the organization or to have as your in-group the people who are in your company and as the out-group the world. Yeah. And so what I mean by that in the first instance is that, for example, if you're thinking about the bottom line, and all you're thinking about is money, is that you're just thinking about how much a person costs to, to keep employed. And so you might fire someone just be based on a number, not based on who they are as a human being. So it's easy to forget the human being behind the number. And worse than that, there was a car which came out, which if it got hit, this is in your book, which if it got hit from the back, it was a Ford Pinto. Mm -hmm. If it got hit in the back- I like it, that you've opened the book and you're now I, about well, to I'm read not, out of it. Well, are you gonna give us a, a, yeah, a, a wee reading? Uh, <laughs> You'd be the first person was, to do a reading was, out of my book. I was just giving, gonna give you the stats because it's amazing. So they, if the car got hit from behind, it would explode. And they did a calculation that changing it, uh, I'm looking for the figure here, changing it would cost of, uh, $11 per car. 
um, and it would save about 180 lives per year is what they decided. Then they decided the court cases. It would be cheaper not to do that and pay off the court cases. And that is absolutely horrific. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I'm just looking for the bit that was estimated between 27 and 180 people died due to this issue. Um, which is, I mean, any deaths, it's like they've actually got blood on their hands, haven't they? Mm-hmm. But they know that, and that's capitalism for you. Like, mm, come on, let's let's not spend the money because we can pay off the court cases instead. How mad is that? It's mad, and it's also, it reminds us that as much as we think that we are, you know, my life is uh, sort of uh, priceless, uh, that no one could sort of spend X amount of money to, to buy me. Yeah. Um, our body does have a price tag, certainly in, in courts. Like this is a, a seemingly impossible task that courts have to do all the time is if you lose a limb at your workplace because your workplace wasn't structured properly, for example, or someone attacks you or you uh, or they uh, negligently, they, they hurt you in some way. Like if you lose a limb, you get an X amount of money for it. Yeah. And there's sort of very sort of, you know, your, your right arm, it costs more than your left arm and your, if you're right-handed and, you know, your pinky costs less than your index finger and all these things. And so like every piece of you has a price tag, almost like meat, really. Uh, and we forget that. And when you, when you break it down and you look at these lawsuits and when you look at sort of the fear around uh, financial loss, then you can you can say that human lives are worth money and how much and whether it's, quote, worth it to do something as simple as fixing an engine. Yeah. Um, another good example is the HIV drug with this guy who I was fascinated by. I can't remember his name now. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think... <laughs> Pharma bro. Yeah, but I, th- I think people have missed the point of what he, he is really because he's a horrible man who's, who's clearly having fun. He basically bought this drug and then how many percent did he put up? hundred and something percent. Right, more than that. Dr- yeah. A drug that people needed and then he just hiked the price up mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then just went... Ah, tough luck. I want to make the money. That's the way I do it. But, but I've always got this problem with this whole ownership thing we've got, which is this this um, patenting and this uh, copywriting of everything. It's mine. I own it. Pay me. If you want to listen to my record, pay me. If you want to do this, pay me. Pay me. Pay me. Pay me. Pay me. Everyone wants paying for everything, and there's, it's it's a greed thing, I think. And he's just basically shown how ridiculous it is because you can buy anything, and just hike the prices up. Um, People don't ever, uh, you know, say to these the, the really big pharmaceuticals, why are your drugs so high? They can bring it down and reduce their profits, but they don't. Mm. They're all trying to make money at the end of the day. He's just he's just highlighted it in a really big way, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, the, the problems with wanting to make money and wanting to always, uh, I think also this idea that we always need to keep growing, so growth, this sort of, you need to keep growing the company. It needs to be this upwards trend. It can't just be static. You can't just be making the same amount yeah. of money or have the same amount of employees. This idea is that economies need to keep going upwards. Um, and that's unsustainable in its own right. And so it sets up sort of the system to fail, I think. And with uh, drugs and pharma, I think we see, yeah, I mean, it seems like obviously these things should be much more accessible obviously life-saving medicine should be made as widely accessible as possible from an ethical standpoint you think uh but uh it's companies who run it companies who also need to fund their research and they have lots of ways of justifying why they charge x amount of money for each each of their drugs um and you're right i mean occasionally someone comes around and you go well that's that's ludicrous how much this costs and that is completely unaffordable for most people but then again so is healthcare in the u.s for lots of people i mean like there's very foundational structures around just keeping people alive that we have made inaccessible effectively to huge amounts of the world and the ethical issues that raises are enormous. Yeah, I don't want to come over as a, a complete hippie here, but when you've got um, Be- uh, Jeff Bezos for earning $191,000 a minute, <laughs> and then you've got people who can't pay for their health care, and you're going, and, you know... And, uh, the system's uh, fucked. The, 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 <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, in, the, in that world, the, yeah, which the is the world we live in. Chelsea midfielder signed his contract, and they worked out he was going to pay more tax over here then Starbucks and Amazon put together, you're going, oh, well, oh, whoa, this is not working anymore. You yeah. know, you can't have that much money. And then and then you Bill Gates, who gives away all his profits to the Bill Gates Foundation. Everyone goes, that's amazing. He's saving lives. It's like, hold on. Do you need all that money? Mm. Yeah, why? Can you not make your employees' lives better or the, the consumers' life better by not charging as much for it? I don't, it just seems that the, the, the game of collecting money seems to be the big one. And we love it. 
Mm. We love listening to how much you know. You've got to if you if you earn a dollar a minute from the day you were born, you'll be. It takes you to your three thousand five hundred years old before you've got as much money as Jeff Bezos. You know, people <laughs> love doing those sort of stats at people, and you're like, you're, you know, it's just it's it's nuts. Mm. But we th- we love it. We think it's amazing. Yeah. Rather than hold on, mate, what are you doing? Well, and there becomes this cult of personality around the people who do it, who achieve it, who win the game, right? Yeah. Who have as much money as possible, and we go, oh, well, I want to be like that. But I mean, system systemically, you don't like we don't want lots of people. Like but then that. you get a bu- guy who bikes buys a drug and hikes the price up, and goes, yeah. oh, that guy's disgusting. Right. He's disgusting. Right. He's not earned nearly as much as all the other guys are doing it. So you know, again, it's one of those things where we're you know. <laughs> You look at yeah. Well, we are. I mean, everyone's hypocritical. If you're one of those people, I don't do drugs, but if you're one of those people who does coke, you've got to understand that. uh, It's always amazed me. Yeah, because it's always amazed me with the London set, who who I know, you know, obviously hung around because I live here for a while, and the entertainment set, who are all really, I don't know, really into their health food and their campaigns, doing lines of coke. Some kid died in Mexico or Colombia, Mm. you know, or some family got absolutely. to supply that crap to you mm. and it's like but we like to, as humans we like to including myself we like to turn blind eyes to things mm. that we we you know we like to just pick a cherry pick don't we yeah. our moral issues that we like to yeah to yeah. do so um the one though that really got me the, the biggest in your book um and I'm, I'm gonna get on to sex in a minute i know that's the bit everyone wants to talk about and the one that i'm struggle with two them chapters, the most. No less, two on chapters on, on sex. sex yeah there is but the one that i can't get my head around at all and the one that is the one that we should you know everyone should down tools and say we need to sort this problem out right now is is slavery human slave trade human trafficking human slave trade uh, in your book there's a fact which says there's is a, it's a staggering fact there's uh, estimated 21 million slaves still in the world 21 million mm-hmm. i mean w- what the hell is happening that we're still allowing this to happen. Mm. Um, so a lot of slaves in the world, uh, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily, or they're, they're just not the, the, the types of slaves that we sort of picture from sort of American history, for example, yeah. or even British history. Yeah. Um, and uh, so they're not working in fields, for nope. example, in the same way. They're also not kept in the open as much usually. So you're not sort of proud of the fact that you're a slave owner and mm-hmm. you don't get to live in a mansion on a, in a field somewhere in Alabama yep. um, and, and sort of showcase the fact that you have these these individuals. Um, but there are lots of parts of the world, including in the UK, where people um, force people to work for them for no money and uh, take away their rights. So, I mean, it's, and, and, and in some parts of the world, it's, it can go through generations as well. So you can be born into slavery because, for example, your family was so poor that they couldn't pay off some service they needed or some, some person for something they did for them. And so they, that father or that, your parent effectively became a slave through that. And because you were born within that, this assumption is that the debt is still not paid. And so it's, it's framed within this sort of transactional model of you are paying back something to me that you owe me somehow fundamentally. And therefore, I own your, on your, on your life effectively. So one of the big things we see over here is the sex trade, mm. um, human trafficking for, for that industry. Uh, when we find it in this country, uh, we think it's morally incorrect and we prosecute and I assume that's what we do in all this. Kind of, but are there not just not just in the sex industry, but is there is there areas of the world where cultures where slaves are sort of more acceptable by the masses? Yeah, there are. I, I mean, as soon as you have more case systems or you have uh, a different kind of classes than we have in the UK, um, you, you see sort of these hierarchies where people feel like they're justified being in power and they're justified um, dominating or, or enslaving people who are in the lower classes. Um, so I don't want to get into specifics. I also don't know enough about the international differences yeah. around this. Uh, but I do know that the topic is um, hotly debated also in terms of immigration policy. So, I mean, you, you'll see at airports at now uh, campaigns around sort of if you see something, uh, that we're, that you think might be a course of situation. Someone's trying to force someone across the border, for example. Um, you should speak up. And here are sort of the signs you need to look for. And I think that's really good because that's one of the main way, ways now that people who enslave others work yeah. is they effectively drag someone across the border. 
take away their passport. The person can't speak the language. The person doesn't have any contacts. And it's really easy to conceal the fact that they're not there freely. Mm. Again, you talk, you talk about the mental state of people. The person who's doing the um, enslaving mm -hmm. thinks they're superior, thinks they're probably doing the person a favor. Mm -hmm. Um, giving, it's giving, rightfully so. Yeah, it's just there. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're allowed to do. Yeah, and then the person, the victim, thinks they're inferior mm -hmm. and are scared. Scared? Yeah, fear is a, a huge, fear. huge motivator. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm actually reading a science fiction book right now that also has that as a topic. Right. And it's uh, the sort of idea that it's, it's yeah, this fear of of being harmed physically as well of course I, always, I interviewed Harriet Harman on this podcast and I said to her you know it's one of the biggest challenges for politicians isn't it? the juggling between um, tolerance and equality um, you know we've, we're, we've got to tolerate all different cultures including some of our own weird and wonderful ways over here with our class system our uh, school system sometimes and some of uh, the, the you know the, that sort of stuff and then we've got other cultures coming in different religions we want to be tolerant of everything but also we want equality and we want to make sure everything's fair and so it's a it's a tough juggle that I, i'd be careful drawing a, that comparison though because i mean slavery is not inherent to any country i'm not yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not sorry i wasn't making be that careful. About, i wasn't making that about <laughs> slavery i was making okay. that about just it's it's weird that we've got different diff expectations different yeah people are, which you point out people have different cultures and they mm. they grow up in different ways don't they in the world mm. so people have different ideas of of what's what's right and what's wrong yeah and just different time periods i mean if you look at the history of great britain yeah i mean we've done some awful 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 things yeah uh and just sort of this the moral superiority the, that we feel because we're not doing it right now yes <laughs> uh or not doing it as much right now uh is is kind of it's almost funny because like in the not so recent past, we were the ones who were invading people's countries and enslaving them and, you know, doing all kinds of horrible things. Um, and maybe that time will come back. I mean, there's, there's lots of, we can go regress, unfortunately, as well. We don't need to, we can't just assume that our morality is superior or better than everybody else's. This is why to use the word evil, it's, it's an ever-changing thing isn't there it's an yeah. ever-changing um idea of what we believe is evil and what you know if we were to go and enslave people now or even just go and attack somebody's country and take all their resources mm. we'd, we'd all go that's horrendous but years ago we thought that was a great thing for us to do mm. and we might so, again yeah do you think no i, I, <laughs> I think <laughs> anything is possible you do uh yeah you do in this climate okay not just um, in this climate just but but yeah especially this i mean this political climate right now is gong show it's interesting it's, we live in interesting times it is interesting yeah it's an interesting time at the moment um i think social media is really interesting as well i think that's that's um technology is coming along now and well you do a whole bit on your book and technology but that's coming along now and that's that's changing the world we live in dramatically we're gonna have to make our own mind up about um how that's changing it and and uh try and navigate our way through it well and as i discussed in the book we also need new ethics and there's new new vulnerabilities that we have from a sort of even fundamental crime level sort of how we can be attacked you know someone can unlock your front door remotely potentially or turn off your car or uh, steal lots of money or your identity i mean there's mm. so many different ways we can now be harmed um, that have nothing to do with being in front of someone just come back to the hypocrisy there's one bit i can't remember where, i might be able to find it in your book actually where you say we say it's illegal in this country to pay someone for sex mm -hmm. though it's not this is brilliant Porn. though it's not illegal <laughs> to pay to watch somebody else be paid to have sex right so, so porn so, is legal and, and prostitution is not yeah whereas whereas the woman's still getting paid or the man but they're, they're getting yeah. paid to have sex but it's 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 mad isn't it? i never thought about it like that <laughs> it is mad um it's yeah it's and i mean here just to, to, to qualify that a little bit um prostitution is sort of a gray area here so the the laws work generally to um make it harder to have pimps yeah. but they are trying to protect uh prostitutes but in other parts of the world i mean you have absolutely no rights and no police sort of by your side if you're a prostitute but porn totally fine, fine. you're an actress <laughs> <laughs> all right should we move on to sex then because that was the that was a the, good transition yeah it was this this is the one that i i just I found it really fascinating because I got an insight into what goes on in people's heads. Um, so there's, there's uh, obviously we've got to work out what we think is right and what's wrong. 
when it comes to sex, that is a minefield. Mm-hmm. Um, because there are no right or wrongs, or are there? I mean, there's subjective things that you think are right or moral or wrong or immoral. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think there's an objective standard for really much of anything. I haven't got the facts, but there's quite a lot of people who like uh, BDSM. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, why? Why? Why do we like it rough in bed? Uh, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey, I think, puts BDSM on the, the main stage. Um, but it's, or, or into our, into our bedrooms in, in the form of books, sort of a soft entry to BDSM. Um, why do we like to be tied up or whipped or, or chained in bed? Um, mostly it's, it ha- I mean, it has to do with power, but not in the way that we might think. So when you, if you're not interested in these kinds of fetishes, then you're, there's about half of the population that is. So really? you're, you're in good company either way. Uh, but if you don't, if you just watch BDSM and you're not, if that's, that's not a fantasy of yours, it can be hard to understand why you would want to be, you know, I, I, degraded in bed or, or be the one degrading others. Yeah, in bed. I honestly have no idea about it. I believe in equality in the bedroom, Dr. Judy I believe Shaw. in equality in the bedroom <laughs> as well, but it's about no. losing, giving over power. Yeah, effectively. I don't get it. So researchers suggest that this has to do with this sort of letting go. And if you give someone else the power to control you in a safe I mean, BDSM generally has very safe, is a safe environment, right? Yeah. So you have safe words, you have clearly defined relationships, you have clearly defined acts that you often negotiate ahead of time as to what you'd like, uh, which is really important because as soon as it branches out of that, you, you need a way out to say sort of actually, I, I want my control back and I need it back. And that's a really critical element. But to hand over control is to be able to relax and to sort of not have your brain getting in the way of enjoyment. And I think that's why so many people like BDSM and research supports that. That it's, it's hard for us to turn off our, our prefrontal cortex, the, the decision-making part of our brain, and to just enjoy and not think about, you know, image management and what do I look like right now? And you know, is this angle good? Or is he enjoying this? Am I enjoying this? Like, you're thinking too much. You right. need to turn that off sometimes. Okay, so then you, you move on to, um, which, uh, again, it's something which is quite... Oh, fascinating really F- rape fantasies a mm. lot of women have rape fantasies mm-hmm. i was unaware of this <laughs> okay what does that i mean clearly the women don't want to get raped right. in real life so so t- so a rape fantasy is well as as it sounds uh the fantasy of uh being forced to have sex now that doesn't mean that people picture themselves sort of in a back alley getting you know Uh, assaulted by multiple people for example that's not what it means it can mean uh, for example having someone who you know you fancy but is in a relationship or you're in a relationship and they come in and they dominate you and they force you to have sex with them but it ends up being a pleasurable experience so usually rape fantasies have that sort of the piece of I don't want it but I kind of do but I'm not supposed to but I'm not right the sort of I'm not allowed and I'm not giving consent but ultimately, I enjoy it. There are some rape fantasies who get that get really dark, um, and those correlate sometimes with people who have real experiences with rape, which is unfortunately also an astonishingly high number. So it's an it's an, why? it's an awkward conversation, though, isn't it? When you it's an awkward thought process. The idea that you you're fantasizing about being raped with the rape culture we have in the in the world, and we don't want. Mm. And then there's the the fantasy. It, it, is it hard to distance them, um, separate them, sorry? Um, I think, so So for one, I think it can lead to women feeling incredibly guilty about the fact that they have these. So I think most women seem to have rape fantasies of sort. Um, they don't realize other people have these. They don't realize that's a normal thing to have. And so they feel guilty about the fact that they have them and they go, what's wrong with me, right? Because as you said, n- nobody actually wants to get raped. That's not... That's not no. what these are about. Um, and so, again, it's it's leaning more towards the BDSM thing about handing over control, about fantasizing, about someone forcing you to enjoy yourself is usually the theme. And so it's... Um, but, but you're right, it, it brings up lots of complicated thoughts and feelings and and and, and questions around, around how do we talk about these kinds of issues and make sure they don't actually translate into reality. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we could... All say rape is evil, even though we're not trying to use the word. But 
interesting when you talk about it you say you know <coughs> it could be some you know someone's son brother father uncle whatever it's you know it is a person who's doing the the actual raping um the, or the sister or mother or yeah okay but um but yeah more uh, more men yes more men um let let's i suppose the question is is why they're raping because it's it's why would you want to rape someone what is going through your the process of your head to to actually do that and i'm not talking about the guy in the balaclava mm. who's probably got the sort of more mental issues i suppose i don't actually i don't know is it all the same i don't know anything um so as you probably notice and a lot of people probably will notice if they read the book when they read the book because you're yeah. obviously all going to pre-order this book I, immediately I, w I would recommend reading it because i mean we're just skimming the surface here there's so many interesting things you bring up and so many great experiments in it that make so you think yeah google it right now make yeah. you evil <laughs> science behind you andy's dark yeah, side do it. buy it uh but uh, back to <clears throat> back to this very important topic um I, I separate the chapter, it, it, so the, the chapter on sex and coming out, which also touches on things like homosexuality and sort of cultural differences and how that's approached and the coming out process and bisexuality. Um, I separate that, including with rape fantasies and sexual fetishes, I separate that from rape. So rape is in a different chapter entirely. And that's because I think rape isn't about sexual orientation no one is born a rapist like you don't it's not like homosexuality where you're like born with this predisposition that the only thing mm. that you know sexually interests you is rape that's not a thing it's a structural issue where i think it has more to do with acceptance with toxic masculinity with cultural um positioning around a dehumanizing women potentially and treating them as objects rather than people uh, and specifically objects for sexual outcomes um, and, uh, and and the systems that allow those kinds of dynamics to, to flourish. Um, and so, but, but is the on. is the end goal for the man to come? Uh, often it's well, sort of, right? I mean, there is an element that has to do with the actual sex itself, but I think more of it has to do with power and dominance because I think the ability to have sex or to come, let's say it even more broadly, there are other avenues to which you can achieve that, right? You don't even need another human being. So that's obviously not the only reason because there's much easier ways of doing that. It's about dominating another person and intentionally dehumanizing them and using them for, for your enjoyment. Um, so it's, so as suppose, lots of people say, it's not really about, <clears throat> rape isn't really about sex. It's well, about much more than that. I, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about it because it's going, uh, the, the actual incidents of it because it's going on at the moment in the courts. But there's, there's often happens instance where they're sportsmen and they're, the recent one, they're playing a game to see how many sexual partners they can have bands used to do it as well hmm. a lot i'm talking about men here actually and they're they're you know they, they do this thing where they're playing a game to try and see how many different women they can and and that's dehumanizing the woman i suppose is it and it's just that's a, pow a, a power thing yeah it's a power thing and the fact that you have you can have your friends around you your your Mm. bros around you let's go with sort of the, the lad culture kind of idea um who are you know encouraging you to think about people in this way and and encouraging you to treat people in this way and i think that that is incredibly toxic and incre has huge influence so in the in the book i also talk about how there were um there was an experiment where we had well not we researchers had people try to distinguish between comments rapists made and quotes from lads mags mm. and people couldn't tell the difference people didn't know which statements which of these toxic statements about women in particular were from actual rapists and which ones were from lads mags so it's like the the, the that language doesn't turn, is starting that to change that hasn't turned that many men into rapists has it do you think i, I think is it it's, a growing thing no i think it's no. diminishing i think that there is more aware I, I mean i'm not sure if the instance of rape is diminishing over long periods of time, yes, right. it has, but whether sort of this year, uh, I don't know. But I, I do think the language that we're using is changing. I think that's really, really, really important because how we socialize our men is has everything to do with it. Definitely. Uh, is Do you think these men wake up after their trial a year later and go, wow, what did I become? Or do you think that, because you say they're not born that way. So do you think they wake up we're going, why did I do that? I was a, I am a son, a brother, a father or whatever why did i do that i think most 
don't think that. Um, rapists are really great at justifying their behavior and their thoughts. Right. Um, and it's the same with uh, child abusers, for example. Like if you look at the thought patterns of people who mm. sexually abuse children, it's they're warped. They they don't correspond with reality. They they ad adhere to things like this person or or this child, unfortunately, is is asking for it. You know, mm -hmm. they wanted this. They they said no, but they meant yes. I mean, all this stuff that I mean at this point seems so obviously incorrect, given the sort of stories we're hearing and the narrative we're having in the in the media right now. Uh, but they still they're still there. Mm -hmm. This idea that you know, women want to be dominated, and then unfortunately thinking, oh, well, you know, the rape fantasies, and this is where that, this is why I separated them. So, right. well, women have rape fantasies, so obviously they want to be raped. Well, no, those are completely different things. Um, and you need to make sure that you don't link things that aren't true. Mm, that's why it gets confusing, I suppose, the messages. It gets confusing, but again, I think most So you of see it's... 50 shades and everyone's going, wow, it's amazing. And then, and then it's like, yeah, but... Uh, so, women don't want to be dominated in, but they do in that film it's like you know well it's consent yeah it's all about consent and I think it's I haven't read the book by the way I've seen the film so, so I mean Fifty Shades of Grey yeah, yeah. it's terrible it's is it? so poorly written but is, is um, it oh god have you seen it's the film? like a 14 year old wrote a it's so bad I haven't seen the film no. but the book is written very very simply um and but I I mean it's it's just consent I mean it's it's really quite easy yeah it's if someone is and, and asking about consent is sexy, like how do you like it? What do you like? Do you like? Do you want me to kiss you? Like you can weave that in. It's this isn't like a mythical crazy thing. There are easy ways of making sure that the person you are engaging in sexual activity with is actually wanting to do the same with I, you. I think I'm a bit of a prude if I'm honest with you. <laughs> but it's probably also um, isn't it? I, I can't imagine force, trying to force a man to have sex with like that would be so unsexy. And yeah. so I feel like we need to change it's the mentality. It's actually. interesting. Everything we talk about, men are evil. Uh, you know, women... Um, I didn't say men are evil. No, I know. But everything we talk about, <laughs> I am doing. Maybe you're not. I am doing. It's all men. Men are the ones who go to schools and shoot people. Men are raping generally. Well, men are doing this. Men are doing it. Why is it? Why is it men? Why are we evil? Or are we? Or is, it, is it equal? Again, I think a lot of it has to do with socialization. A lot of it has to do with the kind... From, from small on, we give... We treat boys and girls differently, and we allow boys, for example, to to be more outgoing, to try stuff, which is good as well. But it comes with sort of not asking them to inhibit themselves, not asking them to, you know, be careful, monitor yourself, be empathetic, be, you know, emotional, be emotionally available, express yourself. Those are things we reserve more for girls. And we go, you know, girls, be careful, you know, manage mm. how people, the world sees you, manage how you behave, control yourself. With boys, it's so this idea that they need to run free. Um, and the problem is that we, we reinforce violence. We assume it's normal. We assume that things like testosterone are why men are more violent rather than the fact they've decided to be violent. Um, and this compounds over the years. And I think that's, that's how we build men. And I think it's an atrocity that our prisons are filled with men. And we should be tackling this does, much more head on. Does testosterone make me more violent? Not really, no. You're, it's still ultimately your decision to be violent. Um, All right, okay. So you're there. My decision. <laughs> it's so your decision. Do, do you believe... Oh, we discussed this last time you came on, actually. Do you believe in free will? Yes. You do? Yes. I think it's necessary to believe in free will. Okay. Because <laughs> um, I discussed this last time you came on, actually. When they find out that someone murdered because there's some problem in their brain, mm. then do you go... Can you stick them in prison for it or not? Can you, you know, when they, when you realize it was a blood clot or something which sent them. And then when you realize that people are born certain ways, mm. are they, which we can get back onto the, 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 the sexual thing. You're, you're born, I understand you're born a pedophile and you're born to like having sex with animals. I can't remember what that's called. Zoophilia. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, that, we don't know as much about zoophiles, but, um, yeah. <laughs> so you're so you're born that. So that's not free will. But you're probably oh, born so that, with your sexual orientation. Yeah. Yeah. So then, is how many things in your life are free will, or how much? How much are you just? How many decisions are you actually able to make yourself? Yeah. I mean, even yeah. if you're born with a certain sexual proclivity, you still have free will to decide not to act on it. I mean, that, and that's where the difference comes in. I think that okay. we're born with a lot of predispositions. We're born with a lot of tendencies. We're born with a lot of 
sort of foundations for behavior, but to actually engage in that behavior. Mm. That's the next step. And that's also where the criminal justice system comes in and says, this is you being active and deciding to do something. And that's where the problem comes in. It's not, not the core. It's not the sort of human sort of foundation that's the problem it's what you do with it yeah um and i and certainly there are people who are predisposed um to engage more in violence or who, where it's easier for example if you're low on empathy it's easier to hurt people um but that doesn't make you hurt people and if you're grown up if you're brought up in a bad environment where sort of violence is normalized it's easier to be violent because you have fewer inhibitors sort of stopping you and you might think it's normal but it doesn't make you violence it's it, it, these are all contributing factors that together sort of craft this individual but i still think that it's it's most useful to assume that we have free will in the end in that last sort of second before we engage in something i always i always, I always can't when you talk about punishment and stuff i can't ever stop thinking about how we used to hang people in this country or you know uh, 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 france the guillotine mm -hmm. and people used to turn up and watch it mm. i mean that's free will to decide to go up and watch someone die and yet people loved it and it wasn't thought of as a bad thing at all to go and watch someone get hanged or or, or guillotined to death it was yeah. a, uh, now we'd think you're pretty evil to go and watch that wouldn't you that's, well but but we still see people do it online i mean if someone gets beheaded I mean, A, the press might show it. And, and yeah. often it's the sort of, we've censored this. And then one press channel lets out the full video and everyone goes, well, it's out there now. Uh, and they might give a little trigger warning and then just go with it. Um, I mean, you see, and, and on, the, on the internet, of course, it's just unfiltered quite often. You just, you have the ability to click on a link and see horrible things that actually happened. Have you watched uh, And them? people do. I haven't actually. Nor have I. I believe self-censorship is one of the most underrated things ever. If you're about to go and watch a movie and you don't like horror movies, don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's the yeah. same with beheading. I don't want to watch it. Well, and especially with our... Um, I mean, social media is weaponized by organizations like ISIS mm. who are incredibly social media savvy and uh, are incredibly manipulative and they want clicks. Like, that's what they want. They want to instill fear they want to spread their message and the way they're doing that and the way sometimes the press unfortunately helps them do it is by spreading that as wide as possible and so by clicking you're actually encouraging them to do that more because just like with any other sort of media uh, likely the things that get the most likes the things that get the most clicks are the things that you're going to try and do again because it was quote successful so we need to be very very careful in what we're endorsing online hmm. so just like we vote with every dollar we spend we also vote with every click we sort mm. of use online just going back to um uh you do a whole chapter on um I, there was three different uh, three different terms but which i didn't really know but apart from the one pedophile mm -hmm. um there was it, it used to, uh, honestly i recommend anyone read this chapter because it just changed because we automatically assume pedophile evil and yet we send mixed signals because as again you you say in the chapter about porn you're allowed to teen porn mm -hmm. And yet there's a magical age where it's all right to fancy a young woman mm -hmm. and then, or boy, I suppose, I don't know how that works. Or, and then a, a, a bit earlier in their age, it's, it's not okay. Um, but then you also go on to talk, which is, which is an interesting thing in itself, but then you also go on to talk about how um, people are born paedophiles. Mm -hmm. So I read an article once, I was telling you just before we started this podcast, which is really interesting, it's Peter Farr said, uh, and, and you talk all about this in the chapter, he said, I'm a paedophile, but I've never molested a child. I'm not a child molester, I'm not a sex offender, but I can't tell anyone I'm a paedophile because I'll ruin my life. And he'd written this, and I'd never thought about it like that before. That, And he said, there's a difference between being a paedophile where you uh, have um, sexual fantasies and actually carrying them out. Is this true? Yeah, there's definitely a difference. Um, just like, again, just like with any sexual proclivities, you you don't have to act on them, um, and you and there are certainly lots of pedophiles. M m most researchers would argue most people who are predisposed to be pedophiles or have a sexual preference for children or teenagers. And this is what you were saying with the sort of uh, so the uh, let's disambiguate a little bit first and sort of say not all pedophiles or pedophiles, as you would say, are the same. I mean, we sort of treat everyone who has sex with someone under the age of, let's go with 16, yeah. maybe even 18, yeah. uh, the same, which is absurd. We don't actually mean that. Like if you, if you see how we sexualize 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds, 
it's fundamentally different than how we treat four-year-olds. Like it's just not even in the same ballpark. And a lot of us are sexually attracted to teenagers. And, and that's probably quite normal because they have what are called secondary sex characteristics. They, they, look, they, they look like they're almost adults, right? And they, they are able to reproduce. Like they have all these markers that make them, quote, sexy. And it's not to say that it's okay to engage in sexual behavior with those people, but to like looking at teenagers, for example, is much, much, much more widespread than looking at pre, prepubescent kids. So either 10 to 13 or... Uh, proper pedophiles who are people who just enjoy pre- pre- actual prepubescence. So a- anything even up to sort of the, the blooming years, um, usually under the age of 10 or, or 12, depending on the kid, um, that's a pedophile. And that's actually often not what we're talking about when the press labels someone a pedophile. They're talking about someone having sex with a, with a 14-year-old, which, which is different. Um, so, so those are called ephebophiles, people who aren't sexually interested uh, predominantly in teenagers. Um, the question was, what was the question? Well, it's just because I want to, like everybody listening to this wants to go, a pedophile, I hate them, they're mm-hmm. evil, get rid of them. That's what I want to do. I don't want to imagine it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want it anywhere right. near me. Yet it's there. Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable for us, but people are born this way. Mm-hmm. That's what you're telling me in the book. They're born this way. So right. they've not, it's not free will. They haven't chosen to go down a line. And, Who would choose that? I mean, it's, it's, it, you are absolutely it's easier for me censored to, by society. Yeah. You, you know that you can't talk to anybody. You, I mean, it would, it's a horrible pro- proclivity to have, really. So in my mind, I want them to have chosen it so I can say they're evil, get rid of them, right. da, da, da. But then, then as you point, you make out in the book as well, is that... You know, they can't go and talk to people because it's mm. in the law, immediately you're put in a register and you have to report it to the police if someone says I'm attracted to children. So you don't, so, so there are hotlines, um, and, I, and I mentioned this, there's sort of, there is a, a, a budding area of trying to support um, pedophiles who, especially non-offending pedophiles, they're generally called. Um, and you, you can go to a therapist and say, I have a sexual interest in children, but you do need to be very careful because as soon as they think there's an actual risk to children, then, in fact, they, they do potentially need to report Which you. there always will be. Well, there, there, well, and it will depend on the therapist to decide at what point you're actually at risk. So usually things like planning, so saying that you're planning to like target someone, that's when. Uh, someone needs to step in Uh, or I mean definitely if you say oh you've already done it but the problem with that is of course that we completely isolate people who desperately need help because if Uh, you have nowhere to go and you don't know how to stay a non-offending pedophile what are you going to do and so Germany now has is one of the few countries in the world that has a a therapy that you can go to where you can talk about this and the therapist guarantee anonymity um with with some some limits but mostly the idea is that it's better to help someone talk it through so that they don't continue offending rather than just isolating them and not giving them any support what do you think we should do i think we should definitely humanize uh pedophiles some some statistics put the rate up to and especially if we're talking about ephebophiles as well so we're talking about people who are interested in 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 children under the age of 18 or even 20 um there we we see that like two percent of the population has an as a, a predominant or exclusive interest in people of that age. It's a huge amount of the population. And a lot of people don't act on it. And so 2%. They'll pick, 2%. Christ. So they'll pick uh, people who look young. So that there's, again, ways around it. So maybe, you know, you might be a 25-year-old male or a 40-year-old male and pick an, a 19-year-old female who look, if you're heterosexual, and who looks like she's 14. So, I mean, there's different ways of doing it. Or you might fantasize about something while you're doing it. Uh, again, the sort of non-offending side. But a lot of people do also become offenders. And we know that the rates of child sex abuse are really high. And we know that this is a major problem. And typically, offenders are people we know and we love and are part of our family. And that's why we trust them with our children. So like the, the single most common perpetrator for child sexual abuse is a male uncle who's not the father. So a, ma- a male relative who's not the father, sorry. So usually an uncle uh, or, or someone like that. So someone mm. who has access, who's, who has uh, sort of trust and who uses that um, and maybe for the first time in their lives also has access to a child. Is it pretty tough for you to, to align yourself to that though, empathy for pedophile? I'd, I'd really struggle with that because it yeah. is such a taboo. It is, but it's Just, really, really, really important that we don't forget that these are human beings who need our help. And I think if we, if we actually want to keep our kids safe, 
which I think most of us probably do. Uh, I don't even have kids and I want to keep kids safe, mm. uh, even though I sometimes fantasize about throwing them out of airplanes. <laughs> um, it's like, this is the only thing you, like, you have to do this. Yeah. You need to engage with these people and help them not offend. So I think that's, that's where I am. Uh, I have been in, in a courtroom once uh, because I also work as an expert in courts, uh, specific on the topic of memory, but quite often I get called in for ch historic child sexual abuse cases. Um, and especially where there's a question of whether this happened. Uh, so, so questions around memory and false memory and therapy mm -hmm. and that problematic therapeutic techniques. Um, and I've been called some horrible things by lawyers. And uh, one case in particular, uh, the judge got so fed up that this person kept calling me a pedophile sympathizer. Um, really? And in my head, I'm like, but I, like, I don't even see that as an insult because I think that they're human beings. And I think that's a really important way of looking at the world but it gets back to the core bit of your book here is i i struggle to see them as human beings because we want to protect our children so much yeah. all of us i mean it I, I struggle for anyone not to see a child crying and not have empathy for them and go oh i mean i'm obviously screaming on a plane you've got a different thing but you know so everyone has empathy for children everyone looks after children mm. so to actually hurt a child in everybody's mind is just that's the epitome of evil there's mm. no excuse for it you know, move, the, get rid of them, you know, public hanging for them and all that sort of stuff is how we all feel. So that it's, it's the hardest bit of your book. It really it is. is. It was also the hardest to write. Uh, I mean, genu the, the two hardest bits were, one was about slavery, about sex slavery particularly, yeah. because I, it's just so easy to, I don't know, for, for me it was so easy to picture myself being a victim in that situation. And it just, it crosses so many lines and it, it requires so much dehumanizing. But the second was the pedophile chapter. Like I really had to, step away from it and go, I need a break yeah. and I need to come back to this and I need to try and continue to stay neutral because it is really hard. Yeah, it is. Let's just finish on a slightly lighter note. Not that it's, it's well, it's kind of interesting. The, the word creepy. Um, I loved it, your definition of creepy in the book. Not knowing if we should be scared of someone is the uh, definition, mm -hmm. of, uh, definition, of cre uh, definition of creepy where we're sort of going, oh, they're cre are they evil? Are they creepy? Are they that? And then your... Um, the, the examples are clowns, mm -hmm. <laughs> sex shop owners, and taxidermists. And I agree. To, I just started laughing when I read that because, yeah, you know, if you said, met someone and they said, I'm a taxidermist, you're like, what the hell are you yeah, doing? That's, yeah. that's creepy. But you've got to, you, you say, be warned that not all creepy people are creepy. <laughs> Is that true? Not all creepy people are, are harmful. Harmful. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think our creepiness radar is misfire all the time. Yeah. And generally it's, um, I, I mean, it's really hard to put your finger on what, what about someone makes them creepy. And so until quite recently, there actually wasn't any research on it either. And we sort of colloquially talked about, oh, that, that yeah. guy or that woman is so creepy. What do you mean by that? Is it the way they're looking at you? Is it how they're standing? Is it how they're dressed? Is it a combination of those things? Um, and the research uncovered some really f interesting but also funny sort of almost stereotypes that emerged. Yeah. Um, and it, it had to do with this, yeah, like not knowing whether to trust because fear being afraid of something, someone is different than thinking someone's creepy. The creepiness is like, maybe I should be afraid. Um, but that can misfire in the context of just anyone who looks or acts differently than we do. And so this is where we need to be very careful not to, for example, stigmatize mentally ill individuals who are, for example, talking to themselves and assume that they're likely to be violent, distance ourselves physically and socially from them and um, to to just isolate them. So we need to we need to be careful not to do that just because our creepiness reader is going, careful, careful, careful. Yeah, and also if you're good looking, um, mm -hmm. you're never evil, are you? That's the thing. If <laughs> the you're halo good, effect. If you're good looking, you can get away with doing whatever the hell you want. Not quite what I say. <laughs> Actually, you can be too good looking, I talk about in the book as well. Uh, again, if you, I, it's, I, there's, I, there's a sweet spot of attractiveness. And, and of course, you're right on the, on oh, the sweet spot you. there, too. I, I love that example of the, the that, um, the, I can't remember his name now, the criminal with the blue eyes who was, done, they had his photo. He was doing, being in a gang, wasn't he? And yeah. Doing stuff like that. And hasn't he ended up marrying someone? He, he also um, became a model. Yeah, but didn't um, he marry someone in the end? Didn't he marry... Oh, I don't know. A rich person's daughter. Hasn't he married like... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> dreamy, I, dreamy, McDreamy. Yeah. The, the so he ends up doing stuff like that. Listen, thank you so much for coming in. And um, 
uh, discussing this. I, I, I recommend anyone to read this book. It's the, I, I couldn't put it down, and I suppose that's because I liked all the mor- moral dilemmas. I also, like everybody else, likes reading <laughs> about evil, I suppose, and that's it. But it really gets you thinking. Uh, as I say, we've just skimmed the surface here. There's so many uh, good issues in it. Um, thoroughly recommend a read of this. When's it out again? Uh, February 7th and uh, as a fun bonus fact the uh, there's a man peeing on a grave there's death peeing on a grave on the yeah. front of it which is actually drawn by my favorite artist David Trigley that's very impressive um, that so. that's on the front of that <laughs> but it's also just fun trying to trying to make sure that it's clear that it sort of goes between lighthearted co- topics and more serious ones. yeah no it is it's a real it's a real uh, journey through um, thinking your di- what dilemmas basically mm. am I and and I you will on reading this book at some stage saying oh my god i'm a bit evil sometimes <laughs> <laughs> which is what i found uncomfortable about it so um i'll talk to you about that off air all right brilliant thank you so much julia thank you thank so you. much for having me